Welcome everyone to the special installment of the MS Focus, a collaborative federal webinar series. I'm John Kramer, the director of the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration's Office of EMS. Together with our federal partners, NHTSA's Office of EMS is focused on advancing a national vision for EMS. The projects we undertake and the resulting resources for the community help with systems improvements, measuring the health of EMS systems nationwide, and delivering the data that EMS leaders need to advance their individual systems. Another role of the office is to educate the EMS community on new innovations, processes, and technologies that can help to provide better and more efficient patient care. This free webinar series hosted by NHTSA's Office of EMS is a unique opportunity for federal EMS agencies and industry experts to share information with the EMS community. EMS Focus conducts webinars several times throughout the year on issues that are important to the EMS community and provides you with timely information on what federal agencies are doing about them. Today's webinar is being recorded and will be archived on EMS.gov for future viewing and listening. We hope there will be time at the end of the webinar for questions. Please feel free to type in questions or comments using the chat feature throughout the course of the webinar. More information on the EMS Focus webinar series can be found on EMS.gov. As you all are aware, an outbreak of a no novel coronavirus in Wahoo, China has now caused several thousands of deaths and has infected many more thousands throughout China and several other countries worldwide. This coronavirus disease, now referred to as COVID-19, has been declared a public health emergency by the World Health Organization and by the U.S. Health and Human Services Sector, Alex Azar. At the federal level, the Federal Interagency Committee on EMS and each of its member agencies have been collaborating and coordinating efforts to support local, state, tribal EMS systems and 911 systems so communities are better prepared to handle potential or confirmed COVID-19 patients. In particular, our office has been working with both ASPR and the CDC on a number of issues related to this health threat. We wanted to use this opportunity to share information with the EMS community and to offer you an opportunity to hear from those working most closely on addressing the healthcare needs posed by this virus. Today we'll provide the latest information on the coronavirus, including what we know about the virus, the impact that it's had so far, and what may, <clears throat> excuse me, and what might be expected in the future. We also review the recently released interim CDC guidance for EMS and 911 systems in the United States, as well as other important information to help state and local systems prepare for, and if necessary, respond to potential or confirmed coronavirus patients. We'll also briefly talk about some of the other activities happening at the federal level. Please remember to submit your questions through the webinar platform at any time, and we'll try and address those questions at the end of the presentation. At this time, I'd really like to thank and introduce the speakers that will be joining us today from our two federal partner agencies that are taking the lead in helping the nation prepare for and respond to coronavirus outbreak. Captain Lisa Delaney, is Associate Director for Emergency Preparedness and Response at the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health within the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in Atlanta. Jonathan Green is the Deputy Assistant Secretary and Director of Emergency Management and Medical Operations in the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response at the United States Department of Health and Human Services. And I'm John Kramer, Director of the NHTSA Office of EMS. With that, I would like to now turn it over to Captain Delaney to fill us in on the background of coronavirus and help us understand what's going on. Captain Delaney. Uh, great, thank you, John, and, and thanks for the opportunity to present to everyone today. Um, next slide, please. 
this is just an overview of, of what I plan on presenting today. Next slide. Uh, next slide. So uh, COVID-19 uh, was first identified in Wuhan, China in December 2019. It's caused by the virus that was recently named the SARS-CoV-2. Uh, early on, many patients were reported to have a link to a large seafood and live animal market, but later patients did not have exposure to these animal markets. And it that's, this is an indication of person-to-person -person spread. Travel-related exportation of cases um, were first reported in the U.S. on January 21st. And now CDC is reporting confirmed cases um, in the U.S. on our website. So please visit our website to get the, the latest information. Um, there's a rhythm. We don't update every day, but there's a rhythm in which we update case counts. Next slide. So how does it spread? Um, investigations are ongoing to better understand spread. Um, you know, we're, we're saying this is an evolving situation and we're learning um, every day about um, what's going on with this particular virus. Um, we base uh, what we know largely on what's known on other coronaviruses. Um, it's presumed to occur primarily through close person-to-person -person contact. It may occur when respiratory droplets are produced, when an infected person coughs or sneezes, and they're in close contact with someone else, and then those droplets land on your, your mouth or your nose or your eyes. Um, there's a possible transmission um, can, can occur by touching a surface or object that has the virus on it, and then touching the mouth, nose, or eyes. Next slide. Um, patients with COVID-19 um, have um, a, a range of symptoms from mild to severe respiratory illness. The symptoms can include fever, cough, and shortness of breath. The incubation period, so the time in which you're exposed and then you uh, experience symptoms, is between two and 14 days after exposure. So if you have been in China within the past two weeks and developed symptoms, CDC recommends that you call your doctor. Next slide. So these preventive measures don't look very different than what we say for your new normal uh, cold and flu season, but we wanna underscore the importance of just these everyday preventive actions to prevent respiratory illnesses. And it holds true for COVID-19 as well. Wash your hands with soap and water for at least 20 seconds. If you don't have soap and water, use an alcohol-based hand sanitizer. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth with unwashed hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze when it, with a tissue and then throw it away. And clean and disinfect frequently touched objects and surfaces. Currently, there's no specific antiviral treatment license for COVID-19, so we're relying on supportive care to relieve symptoms and manage pneumonia and respiratory failure if it occurs. Next slide. Next slide. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna phase into our CDC response. Um, we established our COVID IM incident management system on January 7th, and then two weeks later, we fully activated our emergency operations center to better provide ongoing support and have uh, a, an agency-wide response. Um, we've deployed multidisciplinary teams to support state and local health departments. Um, about a week ago, we deployed uh, support teams to uh, the Diamond Princess uh, cruise ship in Japan. We're coordinating closely with state and local partners on identifying cases early, conducting case investigations, and learning about the virology, transmission, and clinical spectrum for this disease. We're continuing to develop and refine guidance for multiple audiences, including first responders. Next slide. So to date, um, we have 30 international locations, in addition to the U.S., have reported confirmed cases of COVID-19. On February 21st, CDC announced a change in how confirmed U.S. cases of COVID-19 will be categorized and reported. There are now two categories of COVID-19 cases in the U.S., cases detected through our domestic public health system and cases among people who were repatriated via U.S. Department, State Department flights from Wuhan, China, and from the Diamond Princess cruise. So I think um, in teasing out this, how we're reporting cases, it gives you a better flavor and reflection of how, what transmission is occurring in our communities. So currently we have 12 cases of COVID-19 have been detected in Arizona, California, Illinois, 
Massachusetts, Texas, Washington, and Wisconsin through this US public health surveillance. Two of these cases occurred through person-to-person -person spread. It's important to note both cases occurred after close, prolonged contact with a return traveler from Wuhan. The remaining cases all were in persons who had traveled, and who had traveled to China. Over 400 contacts associated with these cases have been followed with no additional cases detected. Persons repatriated to the United States and tested by CDC um, at, tested positive. We have three that had traveled that originated from Wuhan and 18 from the Diamond Princess cruise ship. So it's important to note, and I want, really want to underscore that the virus is not currently spreading in communities in the United States. And so while the immediate risk of this new virus to the American public is believed to be low at this time, everyone can do their part to help us respond to this emerging public health threat. Next slide. So I want to go into to a little more detail about our interim guidance for EMS. Um, emergency medical services play a vital role in responding to requests for assistance, triaging patients, and providing emergency medical treatment and transport for ill persons. But EMS present unique challenges due to the setting uh, that you provide care. Uh, you do this in enclosed spaces during transport. Uh, it involves rapid decision-making that's needed, and you have limited information um, to draw from when you're making decisions. So that's why coordination between public safety answering points and EMS is critical. Next slide. Municipalities and local EMS authorities should coordinate with state and local public health, PSAPs, and other emergency call centers to determine the need for modified caller queries about COVID-19. This query would help determine the possibility that the call concerns a person who may have signs or symptoms and risk factors for COVID-19. Development of these modified caller queries should be closely coordinated with an EMS medical director and informed by local, state, and federal public health authorities, including the city or county health departments, state health departments, and CDC. They can help you know the current transmission or potential for cases in your jurisdiction. For example, it's important to know if American citizens and exempted persons coming from China will be directed to your jurisdiction. So for example, these citizens um, are being funneled uh, to the US in one of 11 US airports. So if you're in one of the jurisdictions where these airports are located, um, there's a strong chance that if they're a, an ill passenger came into the country that you might be tasked to provide care. And I do know that, that those coordinations are happening. Next slide. If PSAP call takers advise that the patient is suspected of having COVID-19, EMS clinicians should put on appropriate personal protective equipment before entering the scene. If information about potential, the potential for COVID-19 has not been provided by the PSAP, EMS clinicians should exercise appropriate precautions when responding to any patient with signs or symptoms of a respiratory infection. Initial assessment should begin from a distance of at least six feet from the patient, if possible and patient contact should be minimized to the extent possible until a face mask is on the patient. If COVID-19 is, is suspected, then all PPE should be donned. Next slide. EMS clinicians who will directly care for a patient with possible COVID-19 infection or who will be in the compartment with the patient should follow standard contact and airborne precautions, including the use of eye protection. Recommended PPE includes a single pair of disposable patient examination gloves, with the changing the gloves if they become torn or heavily contaminated, disposable isolation gown, respiratory protection, an N95 or higher level respirator, and eye protection, either goggles or a disposable face shield that fully covers the front and sides of the face. CDC is aware that a gown may not be the preferred protection in this environment, and we're currently developing an FAQ to provide further cl clarification on the use of coveralls as another option that could be worn to protect EMS clinicians. Next slide. If possible, consult with medical control before performing aerosol generating procedures for specific guidance. In addition to the PPE described in the previous slide, EMS clinicians should exercise caution if an aerosol generating procedure is necessary. Ventilatory equipment should be equipped with HEPA filtration to filter expired air. And EMS organizations should consult their ventilator equipment manufacturer to confirm appropriate filtra filtration capability and the effect of filtration on positive pressure ventilation. If possible, the rear doors of the transport vehicle should be opened and the HVAC system should be activated during aerosol generating procedures. Next slide. 
If a patient with an exposure history and signs and symptoms suggestive of COVID-19 requires transport to a healthcare facility, the CDC guidance describes actions that should occur. And I've highlighted a few here, but please see the guidance for a complete description. Documentation of patient care should be done after EMS clinicians have completed transport, removed their PPE, and performed hand hygiene. Family members and other contacts of patients with possible COVID-19 should not ride in the transport vehicle if possible. If riding in the transport vehicle, they should wear a face mask. Isolate the ambulance driver from the patient compartment and keep paths through doors and windows tightly shut. And a listing of EMS clinicians and public safety providers involved in the response and level of contact with the patient, for example, no contact with the patient or provided direct patient care should be documented uh, in case and provided to the local health authorities because there may be uh, a need to do additional assessments. Next slide. We describe general guidelines for cleaning or maintaining EMS transport vehicles and equipment after transporting a person under investigation. When cleaning the vehicle, EMS clinicians should wear a disposable gown and gloves. A face shield or face mask and goggles should be also be worn if splashes or sprays during cleaning are anticipated. Routine cleaning and disinfection procedures, um, for example, using cleaners and water to pre-clean surfaces prior to applying an EPA-registered hospital-grade disinfectant to frequently touch surfaces or objects for appropriate contact time, as indicated on the product's label are appropriate for SARS-CoV-2 in healthcare settings, including those patient care areas in which aerosol generating procedures are performed. So products with an EPA-approved emerging viral pathogens, pathogens claim are recommended for use against SARS-CoV-2. And there's more information um, on this in the document. Next slide. So follow-up and or reporting measures for EMS after caring for a PUI patient, um, we recommend that EMS agencies should develop policies for assessing exposure risk and management of EMS personnel potentially exposed in coordination with state and local health authorities. Decisions for monitoring, excluding from work or other public health actions for healthcare um, personnel with potential exposure should be made in consultation with those authorities. We've also, CDC has developed um, guidance for risk assessment and public health management of healthcare personnel that's available on our website that can provide additional information on how um, we go about conducting that risk assessment. And we ask that people report any potential exposures to your chain of command and watch for fever or other respiratory symptoms. Next slide. Um, the responsibilities described in this section um, of the guidance are not specific for the care and transport of persons under investigation or, pa or patients with confirmed COVID-19. However, this interim guidance presents an opportunity to assess current practices and verify that training and procedures are up to date. So we recommend that you assess your current practices and policies around infection control, job or task specific education and training, PPE training and supply, and decontamination processes and supplies. So I wanted to conclude with my presentation by um, pointing you to some valuable CDC resources. Of course, the first is the primary interim guidance that I just discussed. And then the secondary guidance is the um, infection prevention and control, which we, we um, utilize um, the same PPE precautions that are recommended in the healthcare, um, the IPC guidance um, are, are in the EMS guidance. And then on the next slide, um, there's additional resources around personal protective equipment. Um, we offer strategies for optimizing the supplies of N95s because we know that they are in high demand and there are ways that we can reduce demand for those precious resources um, and then considerations for um, their selection in healthcare. So I think with that, I'll um, conclude my portion of the presentation and then hand it over to the next presenter. Thank you. Thank you very much, Captain Delaney. Really appreciate that information. I'm going to break protocol here for a second uh, just because of a question that came in that is particularly applicable to some of the things that you just talked about. Uh, do we have any information yet on the uh, length of time or the potential for the virus to survive on hard surfaces or in uh, dormant states? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I am aware that there are some ongoing studies, um, but we don't have those results yet, which is why we're sort of relying on what we know about coronaviruses. They are fragile um, viruses that are susceptible to temperature and humidity, um, just like an influenza virus. You know, we, they, they don't 
it's likely that they don't persist on surfaces. And we're still trying to understand, even if they are on um, a viable virus is on a surface, what the risk um, would be to transmission. Um, I think uh, some of the statistics I provided earlier about very limited person-to-person um, -person transmission, and those were household contacts, so there's a very intimate, um, uh, close contact occurred for that transmission to take place. Um, and as I mentioned, we had over 400 contacts of these of cases in the U.S. that we've um, followed and, and tested, and they've we've not seen transmission. So I think it's optimistic um, to think that it's it's really probably mo most closely associated with contact, close household contact um, for transmission. But um, I don't have definitive data to, to tell you until those laboratory results um, come back to us about surface survival. Great. Thank you very much. Appreciate all those comments. I'd now like to turn to Mr. Jonathan Green from the Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response, who has the wonderful responsibility of coordinating all of this operational stuff from an ASPR perspective. John. Thanks, John. I appreciate um, the opportunity to uh, be part of this webinar today. Normally, when I um, begin discussion about uh, COVID-19, I talk about the fact that this is uh, an emerging uh, disease that we know uh, very little about and we still have so much more to learn. Um, and that is true, absolutely. But I think the, the narrative has to shift a little bit. There is a lot that we know about viruses in this family. There's a lot that we know about how to treat folks and how to do appropriate infection control and PPE. And I think that the more we focus on what we do know and how to do our jobs collectively, um, the better off uh, we'll be in communicating to providers as well as to the general public. So I just wanted to throw that out there before I talk mainly about the role that the Department of Health and Human Services has had and will have in this um, response. So many of you know that uh, Secretary Azar, Secretary of Health and Human Services, is the lead for the task force responsible for coordinating the response um, from the federal government. And HHS is the lead federal agency. Um, and our activities are lumped into a couple of different areas. Uh, one is the coordination and situational awareness. Some of you may be familiar with the Secretary's Operations Center in Washington, D.C. Um, that has been at full activation now for a number of weeks, and it helps to provide situational awareness and decision support for leaders within the department and other agencies. Um, and joining us within the last couple of weeks have been representatives from FEMA um, to help us support uh, the response in line with the national response framework. And should the response uh, grow out of uh, a ESF-8 or health and human services type uh, focus to a more of a national response, um, it gives us the capacity to turn uh, a, a lot of those response uh, issues over to uh, FEMA. Additionally, from an operational perspective, uh, you've seen a lot of the news about the Department of State flights uh, bringing Americans and dependents back to the United States. Um, and that has been a, a fairly good news story. Um, we've, we've been able to bring home and get back to their homes and their families many hundreds uh, of, of, of citizens and doing so in a manner that's safe for them and safe for the community. Uh, we're dealing with a, a cohort now from the Pacific Princess, which provided additional challenges due to their long-term um, exposure uh, on that ship. Um, and, and we are dealing with, with folks in a number of locations across the country. Um, and then additionally, as was mentioned by Captain Delaney, we're, we're doing um, the screening and uh, housing of those requiring quarantine or isolation um, due to their travel history at 11 um, major uh, ports of entry, airports predominantly ar around the country. And those efforts will continue and they represent the strategy of containment. Uh, I think that over time, there will be a movement from containment to the other phases in our pandemic preparedness planning, um, more about mitigation. And so I think that it's important for the, the audience on, on this webinar to, to revisit the pandemic preparedness planning activities that most of us have been involved in for the past decade or more and understand what the differences between the phases means and the types of activities. There'll be less 
um, traveler isolation um, and, and more activities about dealing with disease in the community should we move from one phase to another. And importantly, it, it isn't we flip a switch here in Washington, D.C., and everyone moves from containment to, to mitigation. I believe that as this uh, outbreak or as this disease um, progresses, you'll see areas where there may be cases and we're trying to do mitigation in those confined geographic areas, while in other geographic areas, we may still be in the containment phase. Um, but over, overall, I think it's important to ensure that we provide consistent, concise, and effective communication with our, our partners, both the provider partners and the general public, because it's through the knowledge that we're going to get through this um, issue. We recognize that from a medical countermeasure perspective, um, there, there is no vaccine um, and there is no treatment specifically. And while the department is fast tracking through BARDA and others, the development of medical countermeasures, we're gonna be relying on NARIN, pharmaceutical interventions, good sound PPE discipline, good public health practice, um, and good messaging to the public to take appropriate actions. Um, those are gonna be the keys. I did wanna to touch on a couple of other areas that I know uh, EMS providers have some concern over, um, supply chain. Supply chain is uh, something that we're monitoring here at HHS. DHS um, has been engaged in that as well. Um, and, and there are some concerns about uh, raw materials and finished product, particularly those um, that revolve around PPE. And so we're evaluating the supply chain and looking at options to maximize the ability to deliver product um, where and when it's needed and look at alternatives for products that are currently in use um, that could be equally as efficacious. Um, and additional information will be posted when it's available. And as was pointed out, there is a bunch of good guidance already out, some of it interim guidance. Um, and as we learn more about the disease and appropriate interventions, additional guidance will be promulgated and posted. And to that end, I think one good place for folks to use as a resource is the Asper Tracy site. And that's T-R-A-C-I-E. If you Google that, um, you'll find that it has a number of um, best practice documents that can be helpful um, for pandemic planning um, overall, as well as some of the specific guidance that's been promulgated and some of that specifically for, for EMS providers. And I think I covered most of the things I wanted to cover in the short amount of time to leave for questions at the end, um, unless you have specific questions, John, you'd like me to address at this time. That's great, John. I appreciate that. I'll um, just circling through a couple of questions here that we'll come back to. There was one, if I can find it again. Uh, I'll continue looking for it. Uh, while we're doing that, um, I wanted to take a minute to, and, and this is really reinforcing uh, a lot of the information that uh, both of the previous speakers have uh, touched on already. As it relates particularly to EMS folks in the field, again, uh, we want to reinforce the appropriate use of PPE, and Captain Delaney um, discussed those at length. Um, we'll note, as she mentioned, the interim guidance currently calls for the use of isolation gowns, understanding that those are uh, sometimes not terribly practical in the EMS field and folks that have as part of their PPE procedures, the use of isolation coveralls, that makes a whole lot of sense that hopefully will be addressed in the CDC frequently uh, asked questions, responses that are being developed now. I again want to reinforce the comment that Mr. Green mentioned a minute ago about surge planning, uh, particularly in the context of personal protective equipment supplies. Um, if folks become aware that they are experiencing difficulty in getting orders filled, please share that with either uh, our office 
or with the uh, ASPR office through the Sec uh, Secretary's Operations Center so that we can be aware of those. ASPR is doing a lot of work with manufacturers and distributors throughout the country and has, uh, uh, I think, a good handle on where resources uh, are in terms of their current availabilities. But if you do experience some of those, please let us know. As Captain Delaney talked about with the uh, interface, <clears throat> excuse me, with the 911 systems and emergency medical dispatch activities, uh, guidances have been provided both in the interim guidance and some of the emergency medical dispatch uh, program vendors have made modifications to uh, their products to help facilitate some of that uh, uh, information gathering. Remember, the, the goal at screening callers is really to identify patients who may be of possible concern as EMS clinicians are responding so that they can be best prepared when they arrive on the scene and as appropriate can then notify the emergency departments in cases where they in fact are transporting patients into an emergency department. Um, ideally, the, the dispatch information will allow folks to put on personal protective equipment if that's appropriate uh, before approaching the patient. If there is some question about it and you have the opportunity of doing an initial assessment a few feet away from the patient, you know, visually and talking with them to, to get a travel history and symptoms history and things like that, uh, certainly do that. Uh, providing the patient of concern with a surgical mask to help with some uh, source patient uh, protection, that's helpful as well. There are a number of educational resources that are available for EMS personnel, and I'll provide links to some of those in just a couple of minutes. Hopefully folks have had the opportunity, uh, as this has been spinning up for the last month or so, of interacting with their local health department, their emergency management system, and, and local health care systems, uh, even the health care coalitions that are active in many of the areas. Um, as, as Mr. Green indicated, we're sort of uh, in the process of containment, but starting to go a little bit more into mitigation and more aggr aggressive forward planning. And we would encourage you all to maintain those interactions with the local health department and healthcare systems um, as this planning moves forward. Uh, I suspect in most areas, local emergency management has not been uh, closely involved in some activities to date, but as Mr. Green alluded to, uh, at the federal level, we're approaching this very much from an emergency management perspective and have established the uh, uh, significant components of the federal incident management structure to help coordinate those things. and. Uh, if activities do need to increase at the local level, it's likely that your emergency management community will be involved as well. We've received some questions, uh, particularly from uh, fire service components that are not directly involved in providing emergency medical services and from the law enforcement community asking questions of EMS and the public health community about how this virus would potentially or could potentially affect them. So um, again, I would encourage local folks to uh, uh, think about engaging them to help them understand the health care aspects, the health care issues, and the risks that their personnel may face and what they can possibly do to uh, help minimize that risk. One of the things that uh, has come up at the federal level has been uh, interactions with some of the uh, federal uh, correctional and detention facilities. The transition to that at a local community is to perhaps think about engaging your local um, 
corrections facilities to make sure that uh, their planning in cooperation with the local health department has been moving forward and what the interface of EMS will be if uh, cases are identified in local corrections facilities. You know, we talk about all of these things within the context that um, hopefully some of this information is reassuring to the general EMS community, as Captain Delaney alluded to, the risk in the United States currently is low, uh, but from some of the questions that have come up that we'll get to in just a minute, there is still some concern and unknown about that. So we really wanna um, use this opportunity to provide reassurance, but also acknowledge that we all need to be very proactive in continuing to do our planning moving forward. Uh, next slide, please. And on this slide, in addition to the references that Captain Delaney uh, provided, are uh, several others that folks can use. The first two CDC references were included on her slides. Um, Mr. Green alluded to the uh, Asper Tracy program. One of the documents that uh, Tracy put out a couple of years ago is an EMS infectious disease playbook which is an extremely valuable resource for local EMS agencies to turn to, to help them understand many of these infectious diseases and how to uh, respond appropriately to them. Admittedly, COVID-19 wasn't included in the playbook because we weren't aware of it at that time, uh, but many of the principles are extremely applicable. The other resource that's there is uh, a NETAC EMS uh, awareness program that's available on the link that you see there. This is a program that uh, uh, covers many highly infectious diseases, uh, not only coronavirus, but it was originally designed for MERS and SARS and Ebola. There is some, um, information that has recently been added to it specific to uh, COVID-19, but uh, much of that is extremely applicable to what we're faced with now. And I would encourage folks to take a look at that. It's an approximately one hour um, uh, online tutorial. With that, I'm gonna start switching over to um, some of the questions that we have received. Um, and now that we've talked about the, the risk in the United States still being low and that there are a small number of um, uh, confirmed cases in the United States, one of the questions that came up early on, uh, do we have an estimate on the time frame when the virus will be in every community nationwide? I will start the response to that out, um, that we're hoping that the containment activities that have been uh, implemented so far in terms of identifying and quarantining and isolating folks uh, have been very effective and in all candor will help to, um, I would like to say eliminate, but certainly minimize the possibility that this will be coming, uh, will occur in every community nationwide. Uh, Lisa or John, any perspective on that? Hey, it's John, I guess I'll start. Um, yeah, I, I don't think that people should be surprised if there are cases reported in the community. I think everyone realizes that the containment um, is only as good as the number of people that we can actually identify who are at risk and then effectively quarantine or isolate. And to, in today's mobile economy and in the age of jet travel, the world is a very interconnected place and it's quite conceivable that we may see cases here. Um, and, and the way that these outbreaks have, have popped up, um, they, they have relatively little, little activity one day and then we have a substantial number of cases in a pocket elsewhere. 
So it's difficult to say when or if we will face um, outbreaks within our community, but I think as the ESF-8 and the EMS community, we have to make plans um, to, to combat that as if it were going to happen. Thank you, John. Um, Lisa, probably um, most importantly for you, can you again clarify, please, the uh, concerns about airborne versus contact precautions and use of N95 masks versus surgical masks? Yes, yeah, sure. So, so because this is an, 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 a new emerging virus, um, we have taken the stance to, to provide as much protection as we possibly can. Um, and that accounts for the potential for airborne transmission. Um, until we know and have more information to pull back on that, that's our standing recommendation. And because we are a well-resourced uh, country, you know, we can, can um, call for these more um, protective measures. Other countries, for example, World Health Organization, they aren't recommending respirators because of the audience that, that, that they're um, uh, tailoring their guidance for. So right now, again, we're still just trying to understand how transmission is happening in our country. We don't have a lot of cases, so that makes it challenging, but that's a good thing. Um, and we will be gathering additional information and adjusting our infection control guidance um, when we have more data. But currently, we are recommending the use of N95 respirators um, before, to acknowledge that there may be potential airborne transmission. Thank you. Um, many folks have, have either heard or are starting to experience uh, some limitation of being able to order N95 masks. And we've had a couple of questions about using expired um, PPE, particularly uh, N95 masks when there's difficulty getting them from vendors. Uh, sure, so I, I can take that. Um, you know, we are aware that there are um, potentially going to be supply challenges. Um, you know, we've we've worked in this pandemic space and we've done modeling um, that suggests that we're we're going to um, need more N95s than are going to be available. And so we are working um, very closely uh, as as an interagency effort with suppliers and distributors to better understand. Um, what what the concerns are and have a better handle on how we can ensure that our guidance matches with with what um, what we're seeing in communities. So um, we know we're not going to be able to buy our way out of this this gap. And so what we're trying to do is think of ways that we can reduce demand of these devices while also increasing supplies. And so um, it's really one of those efforts is the guidance that I referred to, and I had a link on the uh, on the website or on my uh, web presentation, that um, we've developed a, a series of guidance uh, approaches or strategies to optimize the use of N95. Um, things like um, identifying and targeting specific um, healthcare workers to provide care, so that you don't have to have, you know, all of your healthcare workers fit tested and using N95. Um, there's examples of using alternatives to N95 um, where that's possible. So there are other classes of filtering face piece disposable respirators um, beyond N95. There's P100s, um, et cetera, that could also be, um, could be uh, chosen. Um, then maybe less common are the elastomeric respirators, which are more kind of a, like a rubber plastic type device where they actually have cartridge, filter cartridges that um, through into the, the mask itself. And then, um, of course, um, powered air purifying respirators. So there's options um, beyond N95 if you can't secure N95. Um, the question about expired respirators, um, we're, we're actually working on that guidance. It's working its way through the clearance process. So currently, um, what we're saying is that you sh if you do have expired N95s, we recommend that you hold on to them because um, as we move down to um, more crisis standards of care where um, we may not have um, enough supplies, there may be a utility and, and certain purposes where you could use an expired respirator. So there's gonna be more information coming out um, about 
uh, that topic in the in the near future. Thank you. John, this is one that I'm going to turn to you with your uh, previous experience as an EMS uh, operations manager before you got into the federal government. And uh, I may chime in as well. Uh, with the large population of the public listening to public safety radios, how do we go about alerting, alerting EMS units without panicking the public as we dispatch these uh, responses over the radio? Thoughts? Yeah, just just quickly, some thoughts from the past is um, signaling respiratory precautions um, or some code for the use of PPE, not specific for um, the the coronavirus. But but I would say that you know um, even in dealing with with previous infectious disease cases or concerns, it's it's not the patients that you do know or have a high suspicion about. It's the patient that you don't have a high suspicion about that ends up getting you. And this is particularly true with crews that are responding to cases where they find out days or weeks later that the person was a suspect TB case. The, the time to be taking precautions is not necessarily when you know or highly suspect that a patient um, could be a, a COVID-19 case, but rather use your PPE appropriately at all times you're dealing with a respiratory um, type call. Thank you, appreciate that. Um, Lisa, this one is a little bit out of your specific realm, but I do know that CDC is working on these. With the reports of additional outbreaks in other parts of the world, uh, is, is there going to be, or will we see new screening guidances? Yeah, I, I'm not aware of any, but I, I that, again, it's, it, that's a little outside my area, so I, I, I don't think I can answer that question. Um, yeah, at this time. Yep. Um, and I, I'd add, I'm sorry, okay. I, I could add that 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 is a topic of conversation routinely, um, whether it's task force meetings or or with the National Security Council, is is looking at the travel patterns, looking at the risks, and making informed decisions about what travel restrictions to implement or, or guidance to, to put out for folks. Thank you. I, that's sort of exactly what, what I was going to allude to. Um, the, uh, in addition to ASPR, uh, there are components of the CDC. As uh, John mentioned, uh, there is a uh, COVID-19 task force out of the White House that is meeting on a daily basis. And uh, in the Department of Transportation, some of our folks are specifically tasked with uh, working with the CDC and with Customs and Border Protection to look at the uh, volume of cases that are occurring in uh, other countries internationally, look at how those potential travelers are coming to the United States, um, whether uh, it's appropriate to identify uh, new screening guidances. So uh, that is being discussed almost on a daily basis. At this point, um, there hasn't been a, a need to um, modify the screening guidances. There have been some modifications to uh, travel uh, recommendations to folks around the world, but uh, nothing in terms of needing to do new guidances yet. Um, are hospital designations for this coronavirus being considered as they were for Ebola as it relates to EMS destinations? Um, I guess I can take that one. Um, I mean, right now we are not planning on having, you know, that tiered system like what that we established um, for Ebola. I think partly because this is um, a disease that's very difficult um, because it, it, it's going to be very similar to say a person who has the flu or other, you know, cold, um, a cold. And so it's going to be, it would be, I think, somewhat challenging to try to implement um, a system where you'd have like a certain hospital that would receive care. Um, and I think you know, we do feel that um, healthcare systems um, would be prepared to take care of a patient um, and that there wouldn't need to be, you know, a designated hospital. Um, that being said, 
Uh, if you go to more pandemic uh, uh, planning scenarios, I, you know, I could foresee on down the road in a very severe pandemic, which we're certainly not in at this point, that that would be something that could be discussed. But right now, um, that, that's not on the table. The only thing I would add is that, that I absolutely agree with that statement, but I also think that healthcare coalitions and the regional Ebola hospitals and health system that was set up um, is a valuable resource to answer questions, provide additional training, and help with any guidance uh, shortfalls that individual agencies might have. It's been my experience that, that all of them are extremely competent and, and are very willing to assist um, other facilities or EMS groups that need that guidance. I appreciate that comment, John. It, we have, have gotten anecdotal information uh, intermittently um, that not all EMS agencies around the country have been involved in their uh, healthcare coalitions. And uh, it's sometimes been a little bit of a challenge to get EMS participating. To folks that are out there listening, if you are currently not aware of your uh, local healthcare coalition, its activities, and the players that are involved in it, um, please start asking around and become involved in the healthcare coalitions in your area because it is a, uh, an extremely valuable resource in terms of not only planning but working on coordinating response activities both at the uh, um, pre-hospital and in the hospital level. Uh, another question that we have here, is there anything unique or do we have to do anything special in terms of disposal of uh, PPE or personnel decontamination if they've been involved in treating a suspected uh, COVID-19 patient? Um, no, you would just follow your routine um, practices. Um, this is, I, I think, um, this is not like at the Ebola level where it's a Category A agent that you'd have that kind of you'd have to worry about it. Thank you, uh, John. Without wanting to put you on the spot, or actually Lisa too, because the CDC certainly chimes in on these. Um, any comments about? Um, the folks that have been uh, returning to the United States from overseas and have either ended up being a uh, um, patient of interest or with confirmed testing in terms of their uh, housing and either quarantine or isolation activities? I'll, I'll start from, from an operational perspective. Um, as folks are probably aware through open source reporting, we've chosen to utilize Department of Defense facilities, mainly because it provides us uh, the opportunity to engage in our activities um, in, a, in a more secluded area and allow for the privacy of, of the folks that are involved. And the vast majority of the folks that we've um, had the pleasure of repatriating back to the United States have, have been asymptomatic and have tested negative. Um, those that do test positive while on the federal installation are transported to the local facility and either are treated um, if they are symptomatic or they are held there pending um, placement in another suitable facility. And so we're working with the state of California on options there. We have been utilizing the University of Nebraska Medical Center, the Texas Center for Infectious Disease, um, and a couple of other locations that allow for us to place folks in isolation to serve out the, that, that period, um, but not back on the federal installation. Does that help answer the, the, the question, John? Yes, thank you. Um, and then uh, final clinically uh, related question. Do we have uh, any good information on the course of the disease how long uh, if someone were to be exposed and contract the disease, uh, how long they might be out of work uh, while they're ill? Yeah, I mean, I think that we're seeing a, a, a range of symptoms. Um, and so it's hard to pin down a date and we're still 
working out um, questions about um, disposition and release from healthcare, um, and at what point you're no longer contagious. So I think those are still part of strategies that we don't, um, again, because we have so few cases, it's really difficult for us to um, develop guidance or have a lot of knowledge around, but that's certainly something that we're working towards. Um, I will put a, put a plug in for guidance that um, NIOSH issued a couple of weeks ago around general business that was actually meant for businesses who are not um, healthcare and aren't really anticipated to have um, employees with exposures. But in that document, it's, it's um, adapted from what we put out for pandemic. We do talk about sort of anticipating absenteeism um, so that you can plan as a business for um, uh, being able to kind of keep, keep the lights on in the office while at the same time accounting for um, people either to be sick themselves or employers, employees to have to stay home to, to care for children. So something like uh, how long they'd be out would be uh, an important information to have for, for making those planning assumptions, but we don't have that information just yet. Great, thank you. Um, Lisa, any one final take home message that you'd like folks in the EMS community to have? Um, well, I would just like to say that, um, you know, I really appreciate the opportunity to be here and um, that this is, um, despite some of what we're seeing on the news, that this is a, a coronavirus. Um, it doesn't uh, persist in the environment. Um, we have great. Um, ways in IPC and, and other measures to stay protected and um, that I appreciate your, you know, your partnership in um, seeing and, and working through our guidance and are always available if you have any follow-on questions. Thank you. John, any burning last minute takeaway? Just that, you know, things have progressed uh, amazingly over the course of history. When I first became a paramedic 30 years ago, there was only one pair of gloves in the ambulance. And that wasn't to protect me, the paramedic, it was to protect a newborn baby. So I think things have, have gone a, a very long way towards um, helping our providers be safe when they're doing their job. There is a lot that we don't know, but there's a lot that we do, and we're providing guidance uh, and information to providers as we know it. Um, and part of that process will require a two-way street. So if there is information that is being developed from EMS uh, providers around the country or health systems, it's important that that information come back so that we can include that in the calculus uh, as we develop and alter guidance as necessary. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you both Lisa and John for a, a great webinar and for taking the time to share this information with the EMS community. We all will continue to work to make sure that the EMS folks are aware and prepared as we continue to work regarding this virus threat. Thank you all for tuning in and for joining us. As a reminder, we will post the recording of this webinar on the uh, YouTube channel as well as on ems.gov. If you do have questions or want to share information, please don't hesitate to email us at nitsa.ems at dot.gov. And please join us for future editions of EMS Focus. Make sure that uh, you visit it frequently to sign up for upcoming uh, updates on future webinars and for other NHTSA Office of EMS activities. Thank you all for joining us. Enjoy the rest of your day and stay safe out there. Thank you, everybody.